McFinn Levere, and each of you are the sparks. And together, we're going to create that flame that will light our way out of this dreaded disease. And with that, Gabby, it's all yours. So I'm Gabby Fay. Hi, everybody. I'm an actress and filmmaker, and I became connected to ALS in May of 2019 when my mother was diagnosed with bulbar ALS. She is still here today and on her journey, and I definitely attribute that to a lot of the wonderful organizations that we became involved in at the beginning of her diagnosis, including everything ALS. So thank you all for being here. This organization has so much to offer, is really on the, is cutting edge with their information and their research and all of the presentations that they put out every other week. Um, I'm gonna just repeat what McFinn said for everybody who is just entering. All of our talks are recorded and live on the Everything ALS YouTube. So if you have a friend or family member who would like to see this, but is not available today, feel free to direct them to Everything ALS, to our website or to our YouTube. So that is a little bit about me. And I also have the pleasure of introducing our guest today, Professor Matthew Kiernan. Professor Matthew Kiernan is the Brain and Mind Center co-director of Discovery and Translation. His role is to foster multidisciplinary research across the clinical neurosciences to improve research outcomes and facilitate the translation of research innovations directly into clinical practice for the benefit of patients and the community. Professor Matthew Kiernan is the Bushell Chair of Neurology at the University of Sydney. His clinical research unit is located at the Brain and Mind Center. He is a professor of neurology and staff specialist at the Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. He's also a senior scientist at Neuroscience Research Australia. Professor Kiernan leads a research group com comprised of a team of clinicians, scientists, biomedical engineers, doctors, and postdoctoral students with focus on neurological disease. His research, his research team's focus is clinical neurology, in particular disease pathophysiology and treatment strategies of frontotemporal dementia and motor neuron syndromes. Currently, his team is investigating the mechanisms and the possible prevention of neurodegeneration in motor neuron disease, also known as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, frontotemporal dementia, chemotherapy-induced neurotoxicity, stroke, Machado-Joseph disease, spinal mus muscular atrophy, and other inherited neuropathies. He's also involved in clinical trials investigating potential drug treatments for motor neuron disease, multiple sclerosis, and chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. His team's research is intrinsically linked to the provision of clinical services, particularly the forefront multidisciplinary motor neuron disease and frontotemporal dementia clinic and diagnostic neurophysiology clinics. Professor Kiernan is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry at BMJ Publishing Group. He is president of the Australian and New Zealand Association of Neurologists, director of the Motor Neuron Disease Research Institute of Australia, and president of the Australian Brain Foundation, the largest priming institute institution for neuroscience in Australia, responsible for distributing funding towards research and medical education for the treatment and prevention of neurological disorders. So on that note, Professor Kiernan, unless Indu, you have anything to add? No, thank you very much um, for um, joining us. And before we begin, I just wanted to say, you know, um, we, we are so excited that everybody who shows up here uh, every uh, two weeks, and uh, as everything ALS, as we are growing, we're doing our research and many of you are part of our research and we appreciate it. And we are gonna be having a program where we're gonna talk about the results that we found from all the work that you know, we put together with the research that we have, uh, you have partnered with us on. With that, you know, we are also setting up an audit and compliance committee 
with about six people with uh, living with ALS. And uh, today uh, I would like to announce that three of the uh, amazing people who joined us on the committee would be Dina Cellini. Um, she is in the audience here and so is John Harrison and also Michael Robinson. So we will have them come in and introduce themselves in our next session. But if any of you are interested in becoming part of you know, our audit and compliance committee, please send me an email at indu at everythingals.org. And uh, thank you very much. And now uh, back to Matthew. Well, thanks, uh, Gabby, for your uh, very kind introduction. And, and thanks, Everything ALS, for putting together a meeting like this. And I think um, the the image that I have there in the, the center of the slide is an indigenous rock art painting from 40,000 years ago, and it's depicting a network. And I think that's exactly what we have here. We have patients, families, carers, clinicians, and linking to all the various groups who, who, who at their heart want to make the diagnosis of ALS better than it is currently and hopefully come up with improved treatments for patients and families in the future. So as uh, Gabby said, I'm based here in Sydney. Um, and I suppose I'm bringing a perspective from this part of the world, and that includes the Pan-Asian Consortia for the Treatment of ALS, PACTALS. So that's based in Asia. And this region accounts for three fifths of the world population. And we've only started about a few years ago to try and unravel the complexities of ALS through this region. And separately, uh, the World Federation of Neurology, I'm the um, chair of the ALS specialty group. And I'll be touching on some of the things that the World Federation of Neurology is doing in terms of, of ALS. So I suppose um, in terms of unmet needs, so when I was part of the MND Australia board, we asked Deloitte to do a financial impact of, of ALS. In, in Australia, we call it motor neuron disease, but AL, so I'll use the words ALS and MND interchangeably. So they did a costing of, of ALS and they worked out that it came to $1.13 million per patient per year. And to put that into perspective, stroke costs the community about $10,000 per patient. Chronic renal failure on dialysis costs the community $6,000 per patient. So Deloitte's had never seen a figure like this, $1.13 million. It's, it's astronomical. And I think it reflects that ALS affects people in the prime of their adult lives when they're usually working and it brings a significant burden to them, their, pay, their family, carers, and ultimately the loss to society. So it's a massive unmet need. And that's why I think internationally, governments and pharma are very keen to try and improve outcomes for ALS patients. I think as a community, we've been very lucky through where awareness of ALS, which has really gone through the roof courtesy of the Ice Bucket Challenge. You can see here Bill Gates, Tom Cruise, K-pop, Ellen DeGeneres. And I think in Australia, this has been continued on. Unfortunately, um, a, a very famous footballer, Neil Danaher, who's there pictured with uh, Leighton Hewitt, has developed bulba onset uh, ALS. And he was a famous player and a famous coach. And he set up a group called Fight MND. And single-handedly, he's generated $70 million for ALS research. And that has meant a lot of clinical trials have been undertaken um, through his philanthropy. And it's really amazing to see. So next weekend on Monday, it's a long weekend. And it has the freeze at the G. So it's a football match. And everyone in the, in the football arena... So about 100,000 people are wearing these blue beanies which have MND on them. And they walk from the center of the city in Melbourne to the football ground. So it's a sea of MND and it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing event. And it generates um, about $10 million on the day alone, about $2 million just from selling beanies, hats. So, Everything has a beginning, and really the beginning of ALS comes down to Jean-Martin Charcot, a French neurologist working in Salpetria in Paris. Uh, 
he saw about 13 ALS patients in his life, but he followed them with meticulous detail clinically. And the technology of the day was post-mortem examination. So he examined all of these patients through post-mortem examination. This is his slide here. And he came up with the term amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So amyotrophy means muscle wasting. And that's connected to the anterior horn cells. That's the lower motor neuron compartment of the brain. But he also noticed that there was hardening, which means sclerosis, in the lateral part of the spinal cord and the, and the brainstem, which is the corticospinal tract. So that's the upper motor neuron component. So he came up with the term amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which reflects the lower motor neuron and the upper motor neuron in the brain together. And it's really the only disease in human neurology that goes across both, both compartments. And that's why it's so complicated. MS, for instance, which also Charcot described, is purely upper motor neuron, so purely the brain. Or if you have diabetes, it's purely lower motor neuron or a neuropathy. This is the only condition that goes through both compartments of the nervous system. From the time of Charcot, probably until the late 1980s, early 1990s, there wasn't much progress in the field. And the, bi the big step forward was the discovery of superoxide dismutase 1, SOD1, on chromosome 21. And many families around the world contributed to this discovery, including a large uh, cohort of families here in Australia. And people then, when they found this genetic mutation, couldn't work out how that could cause motor neuron disease. And SOD1 is involved in a biochemical pathway, redox. And that led people to look at the pathway. And part of the pathway is glutamate. So then they started to look at glutamate in patients with ALS. So taking spinal fluid, cerebrospinal studies, and they found that glutamate was increased in ALS patients. And that led to this theory of excitotoxicity. For whatever reason, the, the motor neuron is triggered off and it fires spontaneously releasing glutamate into the nervous system and glutamate is toxic to the nervous system and that causes a cascade of death through the motor neuron axis of the of the brain and spinal cord and peripheral nerve and that's the theory that is in currently understood about ALS in terms of an unmet need unfortunately we don't have a test that we can um you know, send patients to a laboratory, get a blood test, and it comes back, yes, they have ALS. So we as clinicians rely on the Charcot approach. So finding upper and lower motor neuron findings on clinical examination. So it's very much a clinical diagnosis. We also do neurophysiology. So that means doing electrical tests of the nerves and also putting EMG needles. So it's very fine needles into the muscles to see what, whether there's damage to the nerves in those muscles. And in motor neuron disease, there is degeneration, but there's also an attempt to regenerate. So the, the, the peripheral nerve is trying to re-innovate the muscles that are dying, but the degeneration happens much quicker than the regeneration. And these are the changes that you see on clinical neurophysiology. Unfortunately, we don't have a good way of looking at the upper motor neuron in motor neuron disease. So of course we do MRI scans, but MRI scans usually are done to try and find another cause of the patient's presentation. Occasionally, as you can see on the left of the slide, you see a signal change, that white dot, involving the corticospinal tract of the brain. But that's an occasional finding. So it's a chance finding. Obviously, if you, if you see that on an MRI scan, it's very indicative of motor neuron disease. So in terms of trying to understand function of the brain, one way to do that is using a transcranial magnetic stimulator. So putting a magnetic impulse to activate the cortical motor neuron. And that's what we do. Um, we've been working on here in Sydney. And just so that you know, the brain of patients with motor neuron disease is hyperexcitable. So that lower trace there is actually a reduced inhibition. And when you start patients on Riluzole, you get a pseudo normalization. It comes back towards normal initially, but it's not normal. The brain is still hyper excitable. And this hyper excitability drives the degeneration that occurs in patients with motor neuron disease, causing their progressive weakness and disability. Now, Linked to the fact that we have no diagnostic test, 
obviously we all want to undertake and patients want to be involved in clinical trials. And we have to have some way of saying that a patient has ALS that we can employ around the world that is universal. So that was, that was the basis for diagnostic criteria. And these actually began with the LS Scorial criteria, which were generated by the World Federation of Neurology in 1994. Um, the problem with a lot of the criteria is they use a, an assessment that goes from suspected to possible to probable to definite disease. And then when you do clinical trials, the companies that run these want patients to be in the probable or definite. And that's the problem. That means, so some patients never become probable or definite. How do we come up with this criteria? Well, probable or definite means that you have upper and lower motor neuron abnormalities. In other words, muscle wasting and weakness with brisk reflexes in two to three regions of your body. So in other words, in your legs, your arms and your speech. And that's usually a late feature of motor neuron disease or ALS. And patients who are possible ALS often die with possible ALS. So they never become probable or definite. And as a result, these, these people are never given the opportunity to become part of a clinical trial. So we hosted a meeting in the Gold Coast in Australia in uh, 2019. And we brought all of the stakeholders together, including ALS Association America, MND Association UK, all of the um, consortia, the European consortia, the NEILS consortia, uh, the World Federation, and we came up with a diagnostic criteria to promote patient enrollment in clinical trials. So we've stripped back all of the possible, suspected, probable, definite, and we've just come up with a very simple diagn uh, diagnostic criteria that ALS is a progressive syndrome. And that's worked out either on clinical examination over time or patient descriptions. If the patient is not progressing, it's not ALS. Secondly, there has to be evidence of upper and lower motor neuron abnormalities. So in other words, muscle wasting and brisk reflexes in at least one region. And of course, we have diagnostic investigations to exclude other criteria. So these have now been published. They're now being incorporated into clinical trials. They're more sensitive and specific than the previous criteria. And we're already seeing now greater enrollment of patients in clinical trials. So as a clinician, I'm down here in the bottom corner once the diagnosis has been made and patients typically survive two to three years from diagnosis. And it's very hard to try and turn that around with a clinical <clears throat> treatment. So it makes us wonder what happened in the preceding years. So in the preceding three, five, 10, all the way back actually to conception of individuals. And we know, for instance, that the brain changes in utero and soon after birth. So in fact, the brain is a inhibitory process. So in fact, when you stroke a child's foot, a, a baby's foot, the toe goes upwards. And then over time, it becomes more inhibited. So this reflex goes downwards. And that's a turnover in the, in, the, in the sort of the physiology of the brain that happens very early on. And whether these changes can occur that are triggering off what becomes subsequently known as ALS, these are the features that we need to get to the bottom of. So what is happening in the years preceding a diagnosis? And until we do that, we're going to struggle to come up with more effective therapies. In terms of patients who get ALS, are there any sort of markers? And usually this sort of referral letter that I've sent back, background history, nil. So typically they have no medical problems. They've never seen a doctor before often. Unlike say stroke patients who have a history of diabetes, blood pressure, they've regularly gone to the doctors. ALS patients tend to have a very limited medical past background. Now, what I'm saying here, these are generalizations based on population studies. Separately, MND or ALS patients have a normal or a low body mass index. They're rarely obese. They tend to be fitness orientated and athletic. And colleagues have now looked at, for instance, coronary artery disease in families of ALS, and they've shown that there's reduced coronary artery disease in patients, reduced coronary artery disease in their parents, reduced artery disease in their grandparents. So this is a very fit population of individuals. 
And separately, there are personality changes. ALS patients tend to be very warm, generous, and there are certain personality traits that are very much linked to ALS. And the athletic side is borne out by studies. So obviously in America, it's called Lou Gehrig's disease after Lou Gehrig. We have the American footballer, Steve Gleason. There's um, this study by Adriano Chio in Italy found a six fold increase in ALS in Italian Premier League football players, which is a remarkable finding. Separately in the top corner there, that's the Australian Davis Cup team from 1986. And this is Peter Doohan. Um, who unfortunately I looked after with motor neurone disease. He's died of motor neurone disease. And next to him is Brad Druitt, who subsequently became the, the chairman of the International Tennis Players Association. He developed bulbar onset ALS, who's my patient. So two, two individuals from the one Davis Cup team have died of ALS, which is uh, remarkable. Now, Another thing that I think has developed is an understanding of the cognitive changes that occur with ALS. And these initial studies, which were undertaken by David Neary and Julie Snowden in the north of England in the late 1980s, identified behavioral changes or what were termed inverted commas mental changes affecting patients. And when I talked to both David and Julie, they said they were reluctant to undertake further studies because they didn't want to increase the stigma for patients diagnosed with ALS. So this research sort of died a death a while ago. And in fact, fundraisers at the time, so for instance, David Niven, the actor, his, his catchphrase, he unfortunately contracted ALS, was being paralyzed in a body, but the brain is intact. And that was something that was generally thought was the case. But in reality, there are behavioral and cognitive changes that affect ALS patients. And this has been brought to understanding through discovery of the C9 open reading frame or C9 off gene. And remarkably, the first identification occurred in Finland. And so in a, in a patient group of sporadic patients, so one-off patients, 46% of those patients had this C9 gene. So they all had a genetic mutation linked to ALS, even though they had no apparent family history. But interestingly, you know your own family history, you know your parents and your grandparents, but after that, it's very unclear your, your own family history generally. And so these people were all related. And in fact, every time the C9 off gene is found, there is a founding Finnish haplotype. So there is one individual who's generated all of this. And he was living in Finland about a thousand years ago. And then we see that the Viking movement through North Europe, and then the migration from Northern Europe to the United States and down to Australia. So each, each time we find the C9 off gene, we find the founding Finnish haplotype, the, the, the individual linked to this disease. So in fact, in Australia, we studied all of our sporadic patients and about 7% of seemingly sporadic patients have this C9 off gene. So this is another unmet need and we should be testing all patients who present to a clinic and studying and investigating whether they have genetic mutations linked to the disease. Firstly, it has incredible implications to that individual and their family. And separately, we're now seeing the introduction of genetic therapies for ALS. So this might actually be a therapy and it's also a way to prevent the disease in subsequent generations. So in terms of looking at what patients were like before they were diagnosed, and this is a study that was undertaken by Ineda Miyoshi, who worked with us. She's an occupational therapist. She's now been appointed as the first professor of allied health in the United Kingdom. But she um, looked, talked to carers and asked had they noticed any changes beforehand and of course they had for five or six years before the diagnosis they had noticed behavioral changes in their partners the partners you know used catchphrases they were more impulsive they had temper outbursts they had problems with their motivation and these these features were there five years before they developed weakness and the i think the most important part is apathy Apathy is very common in neurodegenerative diseases, and this links a lot of the conditions that links Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, Alzheimer's disease, dementia. 
these patients all have prominent apathy for a period of time before they manifest their condition. So I mentioned earlier that we had established PACTALs and interestingly, ALS is completely different across the countries in this region. So one interesting idea is that C9-ORF is not expressed in Asia at all. So um, the Vikings never made it to Asia. So it's a very unusual 0.1% have a genetic mutation linked to C9. Also, the clinical presentations are different. In China, ALS tends to be more lower motor neuron orientated and patients have a longer survival. In Australia, it's more like we see in the United States, ALS. And in between, we have Korea, for instance, that has manifestations in between, say, China and Australia. So by trying to understand the differences in the clinical presentations is a way to try and to understand and unlocking this disease. So with my colleague, Steve Vucic, we then went and looked at about 15,000 ALS patients through the region. And we looked at the log of the incidence versus the age of the onset, and it's a straight line. And the straight line has a slope of six. So that means that there are six things that have to happen for a patient to develop ALS. There has to be six hits. If you have a genetic mutation, that accounts for three of the hits. But there are three other hits that have to happen for a patient to develop the disease. What are they? We still don't know. Whether it's some sort of environmental process that's triggering off this degeneration in genetically predisposed individuals is the likely uh, explanation. So as clinicians, there are certain characteristic features we often see in patients. So uh, this is, uh, I'll try and explain the, the neurology in a simple way. So this is a wasting of the first dorsal interossei, the, the muscle between your thumb and your index finger. And that may suggest a particular nerve problem called an ulnar neuropathy. But this muscle ADM, adductor digiti minimi, which moves your little finger aside, that is also supplied by the ulnar nerve and that's preserved. So it's not an ulnar neuropathy. Separately, adductor pollicis brevis, which is your thumb muscle, is also wasted, and that's supplied by the median nerve. So it's not a nerve problem. It's called the ALS split hand, and this is a reflection of the large part of the brain that we as humans supply the thumb and the index finger. So we are the only mammalian species that can do a pincer grip. And the other part of the huge representation in the motor strip is the bulbar muscles, the throat. And that's because, again, we speak. So as a result of evolution, we have this pincer grip function, which is to write, you know, write, use chopsticks, handle a credit card, type and speak. So this is our evolution, but this is our weakness in the motor system that predisposes ALS. So humans are the only species that develop ALS. The various animal models are not ALS. They might mimic parts of ALS. And that's why as, as a community, we need to focus on the disease as it affects humans. So I recently, oh, this a few years ago, went to Yankee Stadium and I was looking at this picture of Lou Gehrig with some colleagues. And in fact, you can see that he had the ALS split hand. And um, we, we subsequently published that because it was important as part of the discussion to show that Lou Gehrig, there had been people who were saying, well, he didn't have ALS. Well, he clearly did have ALS and it developed in his left foot and then spread to his left hand. But these discussions make us wonder where ALS begins. And, and certainly when I began neurology, ALS was regarded as a neuromuscular condition, muscle wasting. But with things like the understanding of the C9 gene, um, the changes that occur in the brain, the personality changes, we now understand ALS as a primary neurodegenerative process that begins in the brain at the cortical motor neuron. So the motor neuron in the brain would then spread through the human nervous system, through motor pathways, down through the spinal cord, and ultimately going into the neuromuscular panel, causing muscle wasting and weakness, which is how the patient manifests. But these changes in the brain are most likely going on for an extended period before the patient develops weakness. So we've been looking at, as I said, 
um, magnetic uh, stimulation of the cortical motor neuron. And that's just as a, a, a pattern recognition, that's, that, that's what it looks like normally when you use two impulses close to each other. When you look at ALS patients, they lose this period of inhibition. So they've got no inhibition of the brain and they've got a lot of facilitation. In other words, their brain is hyper excitable. And this is the same whether you look at sporadic ALS or familial ALS. So for us as clinicians, we can't distinguish between sporadic and familial. The only way that we can know about it is if there's a family history or if we go on and test the gene that is linked to the disease. Now, a problem with uh, at the clinical trials that we've undertaken is that we've all assumed that ALS was one disease. And a lot of the trials that we had undertook, so we, we undertook the trials with international colleagues of Rilizol in the early 1990s, and there were no real biomarkers that we were using to try and understand the disease. And we've also known over time that ALS is a very heterogeneous heterogeneous disease. So in other words, the bulbar is different to the limb and the genetic is slightly different to the sporadic. And there's lots of different types of ALS within this larger umbrella term. But what we did as clinicians and as a community is we gave the whole group of patients the one drug and tried to work out what happened. But I think now we're seeing that it's much better to try and stratify patients into individual groups and using specific markers of a disease effect, whether that's neurofilaments, whether it's the genetic marker, and through that sort of combination of the clinical presentation, the phenotype, or the genetic understanding, or the manifestation of the disease, and targeting that in a very precise way, we are going to come up with a more individual orientated treatment and better outcomes for patients. Now, thinking outside the box, this is a, a trial that we recently undertook throughout the COVID pandemic, working with um, a company based in Salt Lake City, so clean nanomedicine. We looked at nanocrystalline gold and we undertook a trial, placebo controlled trial um, called Rescue ALS. It's, it was a small underpowered study to, to prove firstly that it was safe and to see whether there was an effect in 46 ALS patients. And I recently presented this data at the uh, American Academy of Neurology meeting in Seattle in April. And the outcomes in terms of survival using various markers, including the NCALS model of survival, seem to be very positive. And obviously we need a larger phase three trial, which we're about to embark on. But in the interim, there is a study through the Healy Center, uh, Merit Sokovitz, in, in Boston, and they've got about 150 patients on this study. So it'll be interesting to see whether altering the energy in brain cells alters the outcomes for ALS patients. So that was a, a brief overview um, of ALS, and I think trying to highlight some of our unmet needs, but what I would say to everyone on the line is that our understanding of the disease has significantly been enhanced over the last 20 years. We came up with various diagnostic guidelines to try and promote patient enrollment in clinical trials. And we know that the earlier patients are involved in trials, the better chance we have of success. Obviously, we would like to start trials before patients even manifested the disease itself. If you want to do neuroprotection, there have to be neurons there to, to protect. Um, we also know that obviously patients do better in a multidisciplinary setting. And I think that the, the world, unfortunately, we've been slightly put back by COVID, but it is a global network. And I, and I would reassure that everyone on this line, that everyone in the, this community works together, uh, be it clinicians, uh, patients, families. And we've been lucky with the significant investment that has occurred, courtesy of the Ice Bucket Challenge. And I can say straight away that the outcomes for patients today are much better than they were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. These have been studied in depth. And I think it should be a goal of all of us to ensure that all patients, 100% of all patients, 100% of patients have access to enrollment in clinical trials. And even if those trials prove to be negatives, patients do better. So we've been looking at historical control outcomes, placebo arms of trials. And over the years, placebo control ALS patients do much better than they did years ago. So of course, we want them all on active therapy, but we don't know what those active therapies are. In the interim, whatever, whatever access patients can get to clinical trials, they should do that. So look, that's, that's, that's a brief overview, and I'm happy to uh, take any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Kiernan, for that presentation. Um, it's amazing. We've been doing this now for years, and every time we learn more and more from presentations like yours. So I appreciate the uh, the simplicity in a lot of the areas that explained a lot. Um, I'm James, and along with Zoe, we're uh, student ambassadors, and we will be leading the Q and A portion. And I'm going to jump right in because we've got a handful of questions for you. Uh, can first I ask, form, uh, so, uh, James, before you start, can I just ask uh, Dr. Matthew to uh, sh stop sharing? Please yeah. Start. Thank you. There we go. Made it much bigger. <laughs> so the first question we have for you is, are there any pre-diagnostic signs of ALS? And if so, what are they? Well, firstly, I would I, I tackle this from a, a, a across the board neurodegeneration. So we know, for instance, in Parkinson's disease, for five to 10 years, there's altered sleep. So their partners of Parkinson's disease say that their, their, their partners are moving their feet a lot, eye movement disorders, uh, sleep disorders. In the case of ALS, as I mentioned in the talk, we know that there are behavioral changes and the, the common feature is apathy, so withdrawal. Um, and separate to that, obviously, the frontal involvement. So in other words, personality changes, impulsiveness. I would suspect the, the holy grail in this area is having a marker of TDP43. So that's the protein that spreads through the brain. If we could come up with a marker of TDP43, that would be one way of working out a pre-diagnostic phase. So for instance, if, if there were changes of people TDP43 on a PET scan, I suspect that will be there years before manifestation of the disease. But unfortunately, we don't have a simple test to run on a patient, <clears throat> on an individual, a healthy individual. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question that we got was, uh, what percent of ALS patients are uh, hereditary? So this is a moving field. Um, as I said, when I started neurology, there was no, we knew there were families. So we, we had large cohorts of families affected with ALS, but there was no identified gene. SOD1 was the first, obviously now TDP43, fused in sarcoma, C9 off. It's up around 20% of a population. People could reasonably ask, is all of ALS hereditary or genetic? It doesn't seem to be. Um, but that doesn't mean as well that there are genetic predispositions to certain insults that may trigger the disease. But at the moment, the general understanding is about 15 to 20%. Quite a substantial number. Um, the next question to go piggybacking on the hereditary form of familial is, I believe, what we commonly discuss it as. Are there any established links between the two genes, the uh, C9 ORF and the SOD1 genes amongst themselves? Very good question. All of the genes linked to ALS tend to be RNA linked, RNA biology. The other thing is they seem to be linked to, let's say this, I mean, energy dependent processes. So yes, I think that these are all linked. And perhaps part of the understanding then is that these are, as I said, there's a certain um, athletic background to a lot of, the, again, these are generalizations, but there seems to be RNA biology is the, the, the clue to trying to understand ALS. And there's a lot of work going on that at the moment. But yes, the, jinx, the genes are, are seemingly linked in a larger family so far. Very interesting. The next question that we got was, uh, one of the participants was wondering if you could comment on the updates or the status of the Gold Coast criteria for ALS. So the criteria have been endorsed by the World Federation of Neurology. They've been validated now, um, and these studies were published in Annals of Neurology, 500 patients showing they're more sensitive and specific. They've been validated in European populations and also validated in Asia. So large Chinese study and Korean and J Japanese studies. Now we're starting to see that pharma in industry are taking them on as part of their uh, clinical trial approaches. And I would say when a neurologist diagnoses ALS, when we've looked at this through postmortem and registry data, they're about 96% 90, accurate. 
So if an ALS, if a clinician says it's ALS, it's going to be ALS. And so that was why we wanted to get rid of this possible, suspected, probable, definite. We wanted to remove and cast that, that sort of approach. And I think we'll see more and more that the Gold Coast criteria will be incorporated uh, in, in clinical trials. I know environmental factors are a huge topic of research for ALS. Uh, specifically, though, yeah. has there been any evidence that alcohol use or trauma can activate or trigger ALS? Again, very good question. So there have been large systematic reviews looking at trauma. So oftentimes patients will say that they fell over or injured themselves and then they've developed muscle wasting. It turns out on large population studies, the link to trauma is not clear. And in fact, one of the other, the alternate hypothesis is that the reason they fell over was they were starting to develop weakness and that was the manifestation of the disease itself. We do know that extreme trauma can trigger the disease. So for instance, very high voltage electric shocks. So with burn marks, if someone you know touches a high wire electricity circuit and they get entry and exit burns, patients have been seen to develop ALS in that body region uh, subsequently. But um, so as it stands, trauma is not clearly linked to the development of ALS. Wow, that's very interesting. Um, the next question that we got was just to see if you could expand a little bit on what you said before about ALS being a solely human disease. Well, this is a controversial uh, topic. And, and sometimes when I've talked about this at conferences, I, I, get, into, I get into trouble. But um, so with the discovery of the SOD1 gene, obviously there was uh, the development of the SOD1 mouse model of ALS. And there's now been probably about 200 positive trials in the SOD1 mouse uh, of ALS, positive trials. And not one of those has translated into a therapy for a patient with ALS. Rilizol was used in the SOD1 mouse and was positive, but it was used in the SOD1 mouse after it had been positive in patients. So I suppose what I would say is like, I think, I think the, the, the mouse model is very useful for understanding patterns of a disease or potential pathways, but a model is only as good as the disease it actually models. And we had, a, we had a debate at one of the international conference, has the SOD1 mouse passed its time? I mean, we still have a lot of people investing a lot of time, money and interest in the model. So that's why I'm, I'm always um, careful about this discussion. And I think any, any work in any of these fields is helpful, but I think that this is a uniquely human disease and we should be focusing our research on human patients. Well, you weren't wrong about it being a hot topic because the next question also deals with the same thing. Um, just to elaborate a little bit more. So if this, if ALS is indeed solely a human disease, how by using, how does using animal studies um, in, impact that in terms of potential therapeutic drugs? How can you correlate the progression of a disease in mouse models with human progression? Well, I mean, the, the premise of the question says, if, if it is a human disease, well, it's not an if, it is a human, it's a fact, it's a human disease. Now, are the models useful? Well, yes, they are useful, but are they, can we use it, for instance, looking at toxicities for drugs? Of course, all of these things should be undertaken. Um, can we correlate, you know, plasma levels in a, a mouse model to project what we're going to do in patients? Of course we can. Can we look at pathways of, uh, you know, neurodegeneration in models? Yes, we can. And I think information will come from these approaches. It has to be understood, though, in the context of the fact that it is a model. Very cool. Um, the next question that we got was um, the in regards to the hand model. Um, some of our participants were a little bit confused on that and we're wondering if you could just explain that a little more. Yeah. So again, um, back, uh, interestingly, of all the mammalian species in the world, 
No mammal does this. Uh, that's a uniquely human characteristic, the pincer grip. And that's critical to a lot of the things we do in life. As I said, holding a pen, passing a credit card, using chopsticks. And as a result, the strip of the brain, the motor strip, which I tried to show in the graph, has a huge thumb and a huge index finger. So the motor strip is very much thumb and index finger. The other biggest representation on the motor strip is the mouth and the tongue. And interestingly, these biggest areas of the motor strip of the brain of humans tend to be the two main areas that are typically affected in ALS. So what I, I'm proposing is that we have evolved as a species and we have these talents, speech, pincer grip, but these are very big networks in the brain and they're prone to instability. And when something happens at a cellular level, the way it manifests in the motor strip, TDP 43, is split hand presentation of ALS, slurred speech. These are the common presentations of ALS. That's very interesting. I wasn't aware of the thumb and the index finger made up such a, a big portion. Um, to kind of uh, go into the criteria aspect of this, do you anticipate or foresee the criteria for clinical trials specifically changing at all for those afflicted with ALS? Yes, yes, I do. So we are already seeing um, now the genetic therapies coming into clinical trials. The genetic therapies will need their own criteria. So if you want to do a trial in SOD1, C9-ORF, TDP43, FUS, you will need to, as a company and as a community, patients, work out who you want to target with that trial first up. Do you want to target people manifesting the disease? If so, how affected do they want to be? Do you want to start testing pre-symptomatic individuals? Do you want to test individuals from families without any manifestations? Each of those trials will re require their own criteria. So the Gold Coast criteria were not, in, were not built for that discussion. Separately, as I mentioned, if we get a marker for TDP43, well, of course, we might incorporate that in the criteria. Much as in, in, in multiple sclerosis now, MRI changes are used in the McDonald and the expanded McDonald criteria for MS. So in other words, if you have inflammation of the brain on the MRI scan, that is diagnostic of MS. So if we had a change in a TDP43 marker on a PET scan, that is ALS. So that will be incorporated if we had that technology. We don't have it at the moment. Separately, neurofilaments, well, they a, a part of neurofilaments or neurofilaments themselves may be incorporated if we were able to show some sort of change in the course of the disease related to therapy. We know that when patients are diagnosed, neurofilaments go up through the roof. But so far, they don't seem to change with any of the therapies that we have at the moment. That isn't to say that they won't change. So an example is spinal muscular atrophy in the pediatric population, so childhood motor neurone disease. When they're started on genetic therapies with high neurofilaments, the neurofilament levels come down. So there may be some modifications uh, of these criteria. But at the moment, um, the criteria basically opening, opening the 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 world to access to clinical trials. That's the aim of these consensus criteria. Very cool. Um, the next question that we got is how are the internal and general doctors being trained to identify ALS? Very, very good question. And, and we've been looking at that even just from like general practitioners, unfortunately, a general practitioner will probably often uh, will only see one patient in their lifetime. And, and if you only see one patient, it's very hard to come up with a pattern of this. So a lot of it is, um, of course, we're trying to explain awareness and, and things like the ice bucket challenge, all of this is helping the community. But the reality is even it, it's a very unusual and difficult diagnosis, but hopefully uh, with better therapies and more patients staying alive, 
the more people will become aware of the condition itself. But you, whoever asked that question, it's a very good question and, and it, it is a difficult area. You know, one of the challenges with doing research is the um, longevity aspect for those afflicted with ALS to do long-term case studies. Um, speaking of case studies, can you share any comments on the OLE data for individuals from the rescue ALS trial? I'm not sure if that was- Yeah, yeah. well, what, what I could say is, so we did this all the way through the COVID pandemic and we required patients to come every three months and they all came throughout the period of COVID. So that's an important message. And that shows again, the strength, resilience and generosity of ALS patients. Separately, when you undertake a clinical trial, you expect about a 20% dropout of patients. We had no dropouts from uh, the patients who were treated with the active medication. Separately, now we've got, we're going for about 130 months post completion of the trial, and we still have um, mid 30s out of the 42 patients on the therapy. So the survival data is now starting to become very strong. Obviously, this is a small study of 42 individuals, so it wasn't built to be a definitive study. But the case studies that I see um, as an ALS clinician who's worked in the field for 30 years make me um, think about it because I, 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 I do notice a change. Okay, wonderful. Um, the next question that we got is, um whether you think ALS affects certain cultures more than others? Very, very good question. Um, and that was part of the idea of setting up PACTALs. The incidence of ALS is relatively similar across different populations. That's not to say that the manifestation of ALS is the same in those populations. So ALS in China is different to ALS in America. On, on a population basis. And it's by unpicking these genetic and epigenetic differences that again, we will come up with better understanding of the disease. Could not agree more. Um, so in terms of therapy, I know a popular one has been uh, the idea of stem cells. And uh, we got asked, what do you think of your personal opinion on stem cell therapy for the use of ALS treatment? So stem cells represent a very um, you know, important area of research, both basic research and clinical research in neurology and in health in general. However, the stem cell approaches to date have not represented significant benefit for patients with, with ALS. Now I know that there is the neuron study and, and some people have described benefit and, and I can, you know, that, that, that these things need to be um, better sort of explained and I suppose understood by the community. Separately, I mean, when, when we diagnose patients with ALS, it's a very, uh, it's a tragic and catastrophic diagnosis. And of course, they will ask, you know, what, what's available and, and they'll go on looking on the internet and they'll see stem cell therapies. What I would say is a lot of patients I've been involved with have gone and sought stem cell therapies worldwide. And the treatments that they have sought have been unbiological and a lot of them have been linked to financial gain for those individuals who are giving the therapy. So they were not scientific approaches. They were not, for instance, like when you put stem cells into someone's brain, they're foreign cells. So there was no appropriate, you know, understanding of the biology of that process. What I would say is that we should encourage everyone to keep working in the field of stem cell research and, and to try and generate better therapies for ALS. I suspect that stem cells will in, in time represent a way of improving the environment of brain cells in the brain. Whether they can remodel the whole human nervous system seems unlikely as of today, as of you know 2022. The, but the, the, the human motor neuron is typically 1.2 meters long. So it's one of the biggest cells in the body. 
and to try and create something that has been laid down in utero for nine months and then matured over 20 years and then in life for 30 years or 40 years before the presentation, I think that that would be a very hard thing to do. But of course, we should all remain hopeful and positive and we should encourage stem cell research. Sounds great. Thank you for that. Um, the next question that we got was from one of our participants that was actually diagnosed with PLS and an upper motor neuron disease ALS diagnosis. And she was wondering if you think that these two are connected or are completely separate diseases. Very good question and something that we are all as a community grappling with. PLS does seem to be an, an isolated process, but as clinicians, so if someone presents with, for instance, um, stiffness, we use the term spasticity in neurology, brisk reflexes, and no lower motor neuron component, it's very hard to be very to be sure as a clinician that it is PLS. And the only way that we can say it's PLS is by monitoring a patient for an extended period of time. We had a workshop in Philadelphia that was uh, chaired by uh, Hiroshi uh, Mitsumoto uh, from uh, Columbia. And we refined the PLS criteria, but basically we need to wait for at least two years to ensure that there's no evidence of lower motor neuron change. In other words, muscle wasting, fasciculations, changes on EMG. And if you go through that period, then you can be sure that like after about five years, yes, it is PLS. Then the question is, is PLS part of the spectrum of ALS? Is it part of, I, th I think we can safely say it is in the family of motor neuron disorders. Um, I think to say more than that, I'm, I'm, I, I wouldn't know, but it is a distinctive syndrome. Um, we're very keen to come up with clinical trial approaches. Most clinics have a handful of PLS patients and to do a clinical trial, this will need to be a global network. And that's what we're establishing, particularly under the leadership of uh, Hiroshi and um, colleagues. And, and I think we will start seeing various interventions for PLS. The trouble is, again, trying to work out a marker to see whether your therapy has an effect because the, the longevity or the lifetime, the life of a patient with PLS tends to be pretty normal. Um, of course, this has to go with more and more research as time goes on, like you mentioned. And with that, are there any upcoming research to your knowledge that focuses specifically on the slow progressing uh, motor neuron disease? There is. And, and when I talked about precision medicine, one of the ways to do this is to divide the speed of progression for patients. And we, we can do this through mathematical formula. So one approach is the European network for the cure for ALS, the NCALS model. There's also a Delta V, so a change in disease progression. So I think that um, we can delineate patients into slow, medium and fast progressors. A lot of this has been done post hoc. So in other words, once the trial finishes, and some companies will say that they have better effects in whatever type of progression of the disease. And, and that might be something that they can take to the Food and Drugs Administration, the FDA, to get approval for their medication. But it's certainly something that we'll be focusing on as a, as a community. Awesome. So the next question is actually in regards to what you mentioned about um, assessing whether a patient is progressing to diagnose whether they have ALS. Um, how would you define progressing, I guess, how would you decide if someone was progressing if, if they especially had a slow progression, given that sometimes it will take um, at least a year to significantly progress? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, what, what's the best marker of progression, the patient themselves? So when they come back in, they usually say, well, this has changed or that's changed or this is, you know, uh, this is worse or whatever. So the patients themselves understand progression. We as clinicians can understand progression through our assessment and rating scale. So the ALS functional rating score. If patients plateau and stay plateau for an extended period, well, then that that's usually a trigger for me to think, well, is it ALS? And in fact, those are the patients who often turn out not to have ALS. 
And there are unusual type of neuropathies or neuropathies that present with motor syndromes that are amenable to treatment. And some of those patients, you know, do, do well on treatment. And so these are the patients that either have had a miracle cure or, I mean, the reality is if it isn't progressive, it's not ALS. Um, and then I uh, love how this was prefaced before in the question itself. So I'm just going to read it. It's the chicken or the egg question that's been dubbed. In your opinion, what is the likelihood that ALS actually causes genetic changes versus genetic changes causing ALS? Ooh, that's a hard question. Um, it's out of my it's out of my comfort zone. I don't have any particular answer. I would say though that the the genetic changes seem to I would say the genetic changes are a risk factor for the disease. They are not the disease. So patients can have the genetic mutation and live a normal life and die of other causes. So that's a discussion, what we call penetrance. So how, how likely is it that a genetic mutation will manifest the disease? Uh, the, other, the other process like ALS causing genetic changes, I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not well versed on any of that. Okay, so the, this will probably be our last question um, since we're nearing our end time. Um, you mentioned ALS awareness in your, in your talk and the ice bucket challenge. And we were wondering how we could possibly recreate that sort of buzz in the community to increase funding and awareness and what you think may be the best way to do that. Well, our, our example in Australia was to link it to a very strong community. So Australians are very interested in sport. And the fact that this is... Uh, involving now the main sport in Australia on a yearly basis has mean that it meant that it has longevity. So we are generating as a community far more than we ever did through the Ice Bucket Challenge. So perhaps some sort of, and I, I did see the development uh, in America of Lou Gehrig's day uh, through the Major League Baseball, perhaps hooking the the ALS community with a major process like that and developing it like wouldn't it be great if every once a year every every game in America people had you know a, an ALS hat that would generate so much awareness and funding for clinical research so that would be my recommendation but I'm sure there's lots of people on the road on the, the call who have better ideas than I do Well, thank you so much, Professor. Um, we just wanted to say thank you for joining our group and our little family we have here. And we really enjoyed the wonderful overview you gave us. And I personally learned a lot. So um, thank you so much for taking out the time. And um, we did actually have one participant that had her hand raised. If uh, Dr. Austin, Lord, do you wanna interject and give one last question? Thank you so much for allowing me. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm very happy to tell you that Dr. Kiernan actually is one of the world leaders uh, for emphasizing the importance of upper motor neurons in ALS. And his group showed the hyperexcitation occurs much earlier than disease onset. And they really put the brain component on the map. So I'm very thankful to them. And most of our research is also um, affected by their research, by their discoveries. So it was an excellent presentation. Dr. Kiernan, thank you so much. There was one question about the PLS. You remember they said, are they related to ALS? So if you, if you don't mind, I want to tell you um, that we call motor neurons, upper motor neurons, lower motor neurons, is if they are the same group and some of them live in the brain and some of them live in the spinal cord. It, and it says if like they, they are the same, but their location is different. But now we have actually done cellular and molecular analysis and genetic analysis to show that these neurons are, dis, are very different neuron populations. It's us who call them upper versus lower, but the neurons in the brain and the neurons in the spinal cord are born to different progenitors. They never see each other. Their, their development is different. Their transcription factor controls are different. So these are two very, very distinct neuron populations. 
And what makes ALS complex is that both these neurons in the brain and then the neurons in the spinal cord, even though they are not related, they progressively degenerate. So there are very much differences between ALS and um, PLS patients at a cellular level and at a molecular and genetic level, why these neurons degenerate. So I think as Dr. Kiernan has said, understanding the cellular basis of neurodegeneration rather than focusing on the mouse models or disease models, like, you know, would be much more informative. Would you agree? Yeah, well, I'd say thanks, uh, Handy, for very uh, nice comments and, and also for your important insights into the condition. And, and um, as per your comments, I'd say that Handy is one of the, the world leaders in understanding the biology of these processes and doing is doing fantastic work. And, and we, we read all of her papers with great interest and we try to learn from them. So I would agree with her thoughts about the cellular uh, differences between the upper and lower motor neurons. Of course, that, that makes sense and that, that is an important understanding. The only other thing I'd say is, um, like as, as everything ALS said, thank you. I would like to say thank you back for all of the work that everyone on this call does for raising awareness for ALS. You have a fantastic uh, community and, and the fact that you organize these talks get people involved, um, provide education, involve patients, families, and carers is really the model of a great community. So I would say congratulations to you and thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, once again. And uh, just to everyone else that had some questions, we had a bunch of questions this time, but to be respectful of your time, we decided to end it there, but we will email you all of the rest of the questions so we can send them out to the participants. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving such a great uh, evening and uh, I'll hand it over to McFinn. I just say another great presentation, but Professor Keenan, what is driving this passion of yours? Well, only because I'm speaking to you, I, I had a similar experience. So my mother died of ALS and that's when I was a junior doctor. And in fact, there was no, nothing in the community. So I went, there was no ALS association. Um, I'd never seen a patient with ALS in my medical training. I was going to do orthopedics and I thought she thought she had something wrong with her knee. And then I thought, well, you know, I know absolutely nothing about this condition. And that that's what led me into the area. And what I've seen over the last, you know, 30 years has been very transformative. Obviously, it's, it, it's not as fast as we all want, but it has made a big difference. And, and I hope that we will be able to firstly prevent the disease in those who are genetically affected and separately come up with therapies that will maintain them in a maintain patients with, you know, a good quality of life for their life for their lifetime. Thank you so much. It's really interesting that we can bring all of these researchers together and inform everybody in their living room. I'd like to just ask you one more question in a sentence or two. Can you describe to me how you feel about your experience with us tonight? Um, it was very enjoyable. I've, I've loved the Q&A. And I think it's through Q&A and interaction that we all take a step forward. And, you know, maybe the presentation part of it is, this is a word or two, maybe you don't need so much of the presentation and you should focus on Q&A. That was enjoyable for me. I, I liked the interaction. Well, you, you have put us into action with the comments that you've made tonight. So once again, thank you, Doc. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you.